All right, here we go. All right, we're live at the first ever Conquering the Markets macro discussion. A mm -hmm. um, lot of discussion in our group about real estate, investing, how to time the market, how to understand the market. And to me, there's nobody better to speak to that than Michael Zuber. So I'll, I'll give a quick intro or background on Michael, and then maybe, Michael, you can you know, provide your, your credentials. So Mike, Michael's the author of One Rental at a Time. We'll post the link in the, in the, in the chat here or post the video. Uh, and One Rental at a Time is really a method of investing in real estate for people with day jobs, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. people that have a full-time job. They don't have access to capital and teams of people to help them. Um, and, and they're looking to get out of the rat race. And that describes, you know, pretty much everybody in our group. Yeah. Uh, and when, when you and I first met years ago, you had, I think, two or maybe three rental properties. Mm -hmm. At your peak, you just mentioned, uh, was 187 units. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that was most remarkable uh, about your journey is, is how you thrived through possibly the worst real estate market we've had in a century, right? You didn't, uh, you yeah, didn't just survive question. it. <laughs> you yeah. didn't just survive it. You, you, you benefited from it, which yeah, sure. you nailed it. Put, put, put you in a pretty unique spot. So start us yeah. with your journey. And then we've got a pile of questions for you. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I look forward to the questions. Uh, I spend my time since leaving the rat race uh, answering and, and trying to help people. So I, I look forward to your questions, but my journey in real estate investing really starts after a mistake. Uh, it starts on my 30th birthday. Uh, for me, uh, you know, just to put it in time perspective, it was the early 2000s. Uh, I had successfully- so I still turned, have time? Yeah, you still have time. Yeah. So I successfully <laughs> turned seven grand into 200 grand. At the time, it wasn't crypto, it was dot-com stocks. Uh, so, you know, I, I did, you know, what Warren Buffett says. I read all these reports. I got lucky, then beginner's luck and fear of missing out and all of these things. And I started getting cocky and you know, I started going in on margin and, you know, I was winning and winning and winning. So seven grand turned into 200. And then over the course of about a 14 day period, you know, 200 grand turned into 40 grand. And um, yes, you know, some people remind me, well, congrats, Michael, you turned seven into 40. Well, that's not how I remember the story. I remember the story going from 200 <laughs> to 40 grand. Uh, it's just how my mind works. And, you know, to know my story before that, it was one of very humble beginnings, uh, very food insecure. Uh, I was working at 13 to put food in the refrigerator. So I've, I've been working for a long time, worked under the table as early as 11. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I'm very familiar with, with not having much. 30 years old, suffer that whopping loss. I walk into a bookstore, uh, find the purple book, which we all know is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it changed my mindset. It introduced a concept I'd never heard of. Uh, which was rental properties, right? Nobody in my family had anything. I'm the, at, at the time, I was the only college grad, uh, only person with a master's degree. I'm talking across my family, aunts, uncles, wow. cousins, wow. the whole bit, right? So um, I get introduced to this concept and I'm licking my wounds. I go from being a cocky son of a gun to being just feeling like a total idiot because I had 200 grand, which is more money than my parents ever had, ever. And um, then I have 40. And it's probably still more than they ever had, but still, I just feel like an idiot. And I go, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do real estate. I'm going to do one rental at a time. And I'm going I'm to go buy one, right? The book doesn't tell you how. So I spend yeah. the next year reading everything I could. <laughs> and I kind of, by the way, no books tell you how. Yeah, no books tell you how. It's I like, bought a lot of those books. They don't tell <laughs> yeah. you how. I have a bookshelf with, no <laughs> lie, 400 books behind that, all on yeah. real estate. Yeah. Not, not telling you how. Uh, so you know, I, I just get started. Uh, and my journey is I tried to invest in the Bay Area. I live in the Silicon Valley, right? I live in Mountain View, right? I'm a mile and a half from Google. So I'm, I'm in, the, in the mix of the valley. And I try to do what all the books said, invest 30 minutes from home, which didn't work. I tried 52 Sundays in a row. Didn't work. Wow. Right? We drove wow. around, we were looking because we were committed. And it was finally after the 52nd Sunday, my wife, who is far smarter than I am, says, uh, you know, we got we to gotta do something else. And I'm like, the books say, the books say you got to invest close to home. She's like, We're, well, I'm not going out with you anymore unless we do something different. So she pulls out a California map. Long story short, we find Fresno, California, which actually makes financial sense. But Fresno is two and a half hours one way from where we are. 
We've never been there. We don't know anyone, but the numbers make sense. And that's where it all starts. Uh, you know, we, we live where we want, but we invest where the numbers make sense. We bought our first property on Norris Drive, 1818 Norris Drive for 107 grand. And it rented for 1100 bucks. And, and that's this is like 0304, Mike? It's probably December of 02. Yeah, I think it was December. I mean, you could look it up on Zillow. I mean, it's, it's a fun story because uh, 1818 Norris Drive East, 93703, if somebody wanted to look it up. Uh, we buy for 107. Um, we ended up selling it like three years later for 265 or 267. Nice. Right. But we don't sell it. We do a 1031 exchange. Right. 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 So we, we get out. Yeah. We get out before the crash. We go from eight to 80 units the last year before the crash. So when the crash rolls over, we're sitting with apartments, just loving life because yeah, our net worth goes down, but I don't spend my net worth. I spend cash flow, and rents go up. Uh, and then uh, exactly. houses go on sale, right? So if you look at that property on 1818 Norris Drive, it ends up retrading at 75 grand about six years after, or about four years after we wow. started. Uh, wow. So that's just what happened to my market. And, you know, we start buying hand over fist. We buy houses for cash. We buy apartments with no money down. You know, we're, we're you know, the world's on sale and we're, we're taking action. And, you know, ultimately the, the world turns around and, and, and my wife retires like seven years ago. I retired three years ago. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's our story. But yeah, it's, it's a story of being a working stiff. I was in technology. Uh, I busted my ass. I worked 60 hours a week and that's without travel. And, and I had worldwide jobs. So I was all over the place. I invested in a market. I knew no one. I've invested in a market. I've never stayed the night in. Um, but I was investing for cash flow, right? I got burned being greedy and egotistical playing for capital gains. Um, I wasn't going to do that again. Um, you can't eat your stocks, right? Um, <laughs> so I wanted cash flow. And, and thankfully now our cash flow from, from a decent portfolio provides for our living. And, and um, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't suck. It's good. It's a, just such an inspiring I mean, story. Not sucking is like a life goal. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, when you've got such a large portfolio, like 80 to 180, mm -hmm. um, you're obviously not managing the day-to-day -day interactions on any of that. You must have a relationship with a... Yeah, to be clear, I didn't, I didn't manage it when I had one. My job was to bust my ass during the day and make mm -hmm. as much money as I could in my day job. And I was, you know, I paid, at the time I was paying a property manager 10%. Right, which on eleven hundred bucks is one hundred and ten dollars. I was really taking my cash flow down because, again, buying in a market you don't know anyone that you have no experience and no network it. You could try that, but you're going to lose your ass, right? Hmm. So I was paying somebody from day one. My job was to make as much money as I could during the day, save, right, reduce my living expenses, sacrifice, and have as much disposable income so I could buy the next one and the next one and the next one. Right, right. Uh, it was always about cash flow. Yes, California real estate appreciates, but I never count on it. It's not part of my calculation. It just isn't. So it's not part of your ROI model to look not at? Not at all. Really? Interesting. I don't care. I don't even, I think net worth is the most quoted and most misunderstood and useless metric. It means nothing. Because if okay. you can't extract cash flow and live off of it, then what's it doesn't the matter. Point? Yeah. And it's also such crappy assumptions. Like, yes, I think my art is worth this, or I think my house is worth that. But I've lived through a market where stuff goes on sale. And if you try to sell a house, you can't, right? It only matters when exactly. you have a buyer, right? I lived in a market where I sold an asset for 260 that two years later went for 75. What was the right number on my net worth? It, it's, it's just irrelevant, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So you, you probably need to uh, ask a question that Brandon asked. One of our one of our guys. Um, how do you look and track the macro for real estate? So you you talk a lot about how you how you look at your own market every day. And you're, mm. you're tracking metrics and that kind of stuff. Do do you start with the the big macro and then zoom into your like? How, help us. Think yeah, about the, that. the the beauty of my background is I've been doing this for thirty years. I've been studying what the, the biggest macro I study is the U.S. consumer. Hmm. The U.S. Okay. consumer. 67 to 68% of our economy. So if you can figure okay. out if they're scared or greedy, you can make a lot of wise decisions. 
Outside of that, I look at cost of capital, right? Are banks getting tighter or looser? Why? Because that is the largest indicator or largest expense I have every month is mortgage payments. So I want to know, are they getting looser or greedy? Because I've been in environments where they're extremely loose and I've been in environments where they're extremely open or uh, tight. So uh, I'm not sure why my picture just went away, but hopefully you can still hear me. I can. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not going to worry about it then. I don't know what happened to my picture. That'd be great if you can get uh, the video back. I don't on. Know it just, it actually just, there you yeah, are. It's coming you're back. back. Hi, you're back. Hi everyone. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> Hello. But as long as my voice was there. So yeah, again, the macro for me is the U.S. consumer. If okay. I can simply figure out if they are saving or spending, I can figure out where real estate is. And what, where do you, what do you, what metric do you look at then? Are you I don't think at, there is one metric. I look at, I've, I study my market, which again, I call the U.S. consumer my market every day for the last 30 years. I am up and I'm up at 6 a.m. without an alarm clock. I still am. And I read for the first hour uh, of every day. I, I do a daily financial news show based on my readings of the morning. And it could be retail sales. It, like today, what did I look at today? I wanted to know what was going on with Walmart and Home Depot. Why? <laughs> because Walmart <laughs> is the bottom end of the K-shaped recovery I've been talking about. What is going on with their consumers? Well, good news, 6% increase same store sales. Interesting. Stimulus checks clearly working, clearly being spent. Home Depot. Home Depot was up even though new construction was down 13% on single family homes. Home Depot was up like 32% same store sales. So again, new construction of homes might be down, but the existing home sales are going up. You know, so I, I read everything and I try to tie it all together, uh, but it's about the consumer. Interesting. Interesting. And then, um, I mean, do you think about like the Fed and, and that kind of stuff of course. and then work down to interest rates and yield curve and all that well, kind of stuff? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to figure out what the Fed, right? If the Fed hasn't proven to us once again, that they can do some extraordinary things, you haven't been paying attention. Uh, we, we, we have been in a recession and I believe we still are in one technically until the end of the quarter uh, because we haven't exceeded Q4's GDP growth or GDP number, um, but asset prices, Asset prices are only up because the Fed came out with a bazooka and didn't stop firing, whether that's stocks, crypto, or real estate. There's no reason coming out of the depth of this reception that we should be where we are today, other than the Fed has taken the cost of capital to nothing. You can't have a, you can't have a savings account and get a return today. So they have created excess capital and forced you to put it into the market. Now that market started in stocks and tech stocks, crashed 30% and came back. Then I would argue it's gone into crypto. And of course it's gone into real estate with no inventory, it's gone up. So um, yeah, it is uh, crazy times. So yeah, you gotta follow the Fed. So where do, you, where do you think we are in terms of the real estate macro? I mean, is, are we in a mini bubble right now? No, I, mean, I do not think we're in a bubble at all. Uh, again, a lot of people point at the charts and say, hey, look, 2021 prices are the same as 06. We have to be in a bubble. You guys are freaking idiots for saying that. Uh, people don't buy houses based on price. They buy them on payments. And as somebody who's been in the game True. 20 years, I could promise you a payment in 2006 was much higher because the interest rate was six and a half. Today, mm -hmm. it's two and three quarters. Do the freaking math. And oh, by the way, let's not forget affordability is also based on income. Incomes are up in the last 15 years, not down. So no, we are not in a bubble. Could we be getting into a bubble? Yes, but I don't think that's going to happen because I think what we've been missing is inventory. In real estate, nationally speaking, we should have 3.2 million available homes on the market. We have 1 million, maybe 1.1 now. Hmm. Wow. That, that's, that's a problem. And, but I think inventory is coming. We lost a year of people selling homes because they were scared. We told people not to go outside. We told people not to socialize. So guess what? There were no open houses. People didn't sell, but they went to Home Depot and bought paint because their kid wanted a pink bedroom or a blue bedroom or you know, well, whatever. You know, a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, you know, people who wanted to replace their kitchen and redo this bathroom and build a deck. It was they a big bored. opportunity. Yeah. 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 They were bored. Fixing up. <laughs> Yeah. So no bubble. I mean, absolutely not. Could we go to a bubble? Sure. Uh, the only thing that would crash real estate, and I mean crash, meaning mean go negative instead of you know up whatever it is, seven, eight, twelve percent, is if, if the thirty-year rate went from two and three quarters to six percent. And if it did that, you know, over a couple-week period, that would be a problem. I don't see that happening. The Fed has come Can't out and happen. says we're not even thinking about thinking about. Um, that said, I do think rates are higher in December. I think rates are higher next summer but they're not going to explode. Mm -hmm. I mean, and um, 
to add to this conversation, um, what about the deferred uh, payments on mortgages and the foreclosures and what? It's all, uh, the timeline for it is September, September 2021. So yeah. where do you see this going after this? Are we in a danger? We have like no, maybe a slower all. market? Or... Yeah, we're going to have a slower market, but I don't call a slower market danger. Right? We're, we're, yeah, we might be course. splitting hairs. Right? I call danger negative, slower. Yeah. If we go from 12 to 6, is that really that bad? Not really. And I mean, appreciation. So no, I don't see, you know, there are lots of people like to talk about 3.2 million folks in forbearance, which is what you're referring to mortgage forbearance. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of thinking about, oh my God, all of that inventory is going to come on the market at the same time and tank the market. <laughs> no, for lots of reasons. First off, uh, people need to realize that last time that happened, the average foreclosure process was 700 days. Right, right. I remember that because mm -hmm. they the had math. all new regulations to deal with. And do right? the math. It's not going to come. Even if you stop making payments in September, you're not going to be foreclosed for two years. It's just not coming, and I'm and and it's not going to happen. Second, banks are doing the exact opposite of last time. And again, I have 20 years, and I can tell you, last time when a when a borrower called a bank said, "Hey, not, my name is Mike Zuber. I just lost my job. I can't make my payments." The bank said. Don't call me until you're 90 days late. Hang on. Now banks are saying, oh my God, we're in this economy. The CFPB is saying, I can't do this. I can't do that. Let me send Mike Zuber an email and ask if he's in trouble. And if he clicks this little button, he could go into forbearance. So we are going to go from an environment 10 years ago or 15 years ago, what was called strategic default mm -hmm. to an environment of avoidable foreclosures. People oh, are not going to be foreclosed on at all, at any kind of rate. Sure. Could we have a thousand, 10,000? Maybe. It's going to be a non-event. However, there's no appetite people, for pain. There's none. No, this administration doesn't want pain. It's not going to happen. Banks don't want <laughs> it. They remember last time it sucked. It's not coming, <laughs> folks. If you have people out there, I mean, I argue with these idiots online all the time. Uh, people come out and talk about a 40% crash in the real estate market. Mm. You go look it up. Uh, Neil McCoy talked about it. Ken McElroy talked about it. As soon as they did, I came out and said, you guys are freaking wrong. And I'll bet 10,000 bucks to any charity you want. Let's go. None of them took me up on it. They were all wrong. It's not coming, folks. It's not coming. Oh, that's I mean, so maybe they're just telling people huh? what they want to hear. Well, I, I actually think both of them agreed because they don't need the money. I don't think Neil or, or yeah. I mean, it's lots of people. Those are just two names I remember. I mean, some people do it for clicks, right? Because fear sells. Yeah, of course. Um, but I don't think they were. I think they both believed it. Um, ne uh, Neil's a great guy. I think his, his handle on Europe is awesome, far better than mine. Uh, and then um, Ken, he's a multifamily guy. So listening to Ken talk about single families is kind of funny because it's, it's a different mindset. You know, he needs to stay in his lane. He's an awesome multifamily investor, but I don't think I'd go to Ken McElroy for single family homes. And you've done both. Yeah, I have. Um, Nothing the size of Ken though. He's, he's thousands of units. I'm not that big. Do, do you have any, uh, just open question. Do you have any uh, experience with commercial? I mean, it seems yeah, commercial's I, got I a some. completely set, different set of dynamics with death of retail yeah. and Amazon gobbling the world and, mm -hmm. you know, just... Yeah, work from that's, home, all that. that's something everybody needs to realize. When you say real estate, if you're a novice, you think it all goes at the same time. It doesn't. What I proved and wrote about in my book is single family operates very different than multifamily. And oh, by the way, multifamily operates very different than commercial. So if you're paying attention and looking at your market every day, like I have for 20 years, you could jump from a high of houses into a low of apartments and from apartments to commercial. I have several office buildings, uh, no retail, but several office. I guess I do have one mixed use, which has retail on the bottom and houses on top. Um, but yeah, I will buy whatever's on sale and I will sell whatever is stupidly priced. <laughs> How do you identify, like when you say it's on sale, real, like, mm. so when I was looking at multiple family homes, this was uh, years ago, my target was, okay, let's look for something that's two or three family home and mm. I could manage myself and have some kind of an ROI target of uh, six to eight percent was was kind of like what I was. Sure. Okay. Is that the end of the question? I'm sorry. Well, I was yeah. So, so what, is, what is the, like the equation that you would look for to say that a market is ripe or like oh okay. Uh, 
Yeah. So it, it, the key is what I teach about, talk about, and have done is you have to pick your market. So step one, I call it focus. So in your case, you pick, you pick a market, you pick, you know, duplexes and tries. Awesome. That's step one. Step two is you got to look at it daily. And it's not until like day 60, day 75, sometimes day 90, that you could tell me the answer to the following question. And that is, what is the average yield? You may call it cash on cash. I call it yield of my market for duplexes and tries. You could assume it's six to eight, but you don't know until you've looked at your market every day for 90 days and done the math on every listing. That's what you do. So for example, in my market, which we'll just talk single family homes in, in May of 2021, my average yield is 5%. It's just not great, but it is what it is. I can't argue the market. What was my market in 2010? It was 15%. Markets change. So you're looking at, okay, here's what my mortgage is going to be. You probably have some kind of like, okay, I'm going to be 25% down. Here's the mortgage I'm going to take. Mm -hmm. And for the rents, for this kind of ABC quality of home or whatever it is, this is what I can charge. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say, is this value going to appreciate? Is it going to de depreciate? I'm going to focus only on cash flow. Mm -hmm. And can I stay positive on what my mortgage is going to be in order to, to yeah, charge these rents? Yeah. So at first and foremost, uh, if you have an alligator, which is negative cash flow, it's always a bad deal. I will never do that. I learned um, that. <laughs> that that's, that's, that's just dumb. I don't want to work during the day. I don't want to work three hours a week in my day job so my tenants can live in my place. It's not cool. Uh, so that's first and foremost. The second thing is I got to know average. And yeah, the math is really simple. It's, it's rent minus all expenses. And I'm not talking just the interest, right? You have a fully burdened mortgage. You send a check sure. for the full payment. Some people go in and go, well, I don't got to count the $87 because that's principal pay down. Well, did you take the money out of your account? I mean, what's going on here, folks? So yeah, I want to know what average is. And then my whole goal, again, average today is 5% in my market. I will only buy a house that's seven or 8%. It's hard. It's not easy. It takes lots of time. 2020 was the hardest year ever for me. And I've been doing it 20 years. I wrote 250 offers and got nothing. I'm not, I don't wow. mess around. I do this every day. And, and that's what people have to figure out is, is it takes a while to know your market, your asset, in your case, a duplex or try. You have to spend 60, 75, 90 days figuring what average is. And if your average is six, then go do eights. I don't promise it's easy. In fact, it should be hard because if eights were just lying around, everybody buy them. Well, if eights were lying around, then you'd be looking for 10. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You're looking, on, you're looking for some edge on the market. I want to do slightly better than average. Slightly better. I can, yeah. yeah. My whole idea is, right, uh, anybody can buy average. I don't like being average. Never have. So when I was, this was a thing that I was actually looking at, like I said, six years ago, or say, mm -hmm. when I did find sevens, six and sevens, eights, um, I, I often got uh, underbid by cash offers and lost the opportunity. We got it. That's, that's the beauty of real estate is, is again, folks, there's two markets. There's a purchase market and then there's a lending or um, lending market in 2015 cash won because lending was so tight. Most people couldn't get it financing. That right? was about junk right, was yeah. selling. So I was, I was doing, I was doing millions of dollars in private money and doing what now is called the Burr strategy. I would buy junk for cash. I'd pay somebody 10%. I'd fix it up, clean it up, rent it out. And then I'd go get you know bank, bank money. Cash won. Yeah. And I was, dude, I was paying I don't think I wrote an offer at that time that wasn't 20% below asking. And again, I didn't get all of them. I couldn't do all of them, mm. but I can get one a month, one every two months. Mm. Interesting. So really it's, it's that <clears throat> understanding that cash flow percent. I call it yeah. yield. Or some Ye people yield. Call it cash okay. Uh, it's understanding that yield based on your market. You want to be exactly one to two points better kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I had, a, I had a question in my live stream on Sunday. Hey, I'm in a market where my average yield is 1%. What should I do if I found a 3%? The answer is buy the damn thing. Nobody really? should judge okay. you for okay. picking your market. If got you got to invest in a market that's 1% because that's where you live and you don't want to have anybody else sure. and your mom's been there and generation, I don't care. Why should I judge you for investing in a market at 1%? It's your call. This is America. It is land of the free and home of the brave. If you, you want to invest there, invest there. 
Don't get distracted by 10% in some freaking other state. You've chosen 1% market. Awesome. Now go find threes and do all the threes you can. Because if you extrapolate that out, you can do some improvements, whatever. You win and then, long term. Right. And then, and then the somebody the- else can buy it from you for the 1%. Host fix, fix up, yeah. right? And, if you and that, wanted to, that, yeah. that's your upside. Yeah, you could if you were your to. buffer, whatever. Buffer, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cushion. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And so, what what do you do then? You, you pull down uh, real estate, like uh, sales or listings or both. Or... Yeah, I mean, what I would tell the average person is, I'm I'm a very simple person, right? Back in the day when I was doing this, we didn't have any apps or anything, but I would just have a search criteria I would hit every day. And again, folks don't understand. I did that. I've, I've hit my market every day for 20 years, but for the first five years, it was the following criteria. So my market's Fresno, California. It's about a million people, but I hit a certain zip code. It's called 93703, i.e. Mayfair, or the first deal I did was in that zip code. Um, I looked for three or four bedrooms, two baths, two car garage, single story, between 12 and 1500 square feet. That's all I looked at. That would give me between 25 and 50 listings at any one time. That's okay, all okay. I looked at. It's a pretty I reasonable the, number. Yeah. Yeah. I became the guy for three and four bedroom homes in the Mayfair. I could tell you what was a deal and not a deal more than any agent. I could tell you it was really? overpriced and underpriced. <laughs> yeah. It takes time. But yeah, after about 90 days, you don't have to look at the same criteria. But that's the key is you can't get distracted. You can't go, oh my God, I found a three bedroom, four bath in this other zip code. Because other zip codes have other price points. They have other things. They have other rents. They have other factors. I didn't expand out of the Mayfair area in that criteria for probably four years. And, and do you find it's, it's really just one zip code? So one zip code over kind of thing? Or I, I mean, roughly mean? speaking, like if, you, if you're in Fresno, you're not looking at Visalia, right? Oh, now. dude, I, w- I wasn't even looking at 93704, which is like right next two door. miles away. Okay. You can't. 93704 is called the Fig Garden. It is double the entry price and the rents are 30%. How do I know that? Because I eventually got there. But if I would have gotten distracted those first four years, I would have, I would have had negative leverage. I would have been so confused as to not know what's going on. Right. I only had, I spent 20 minutes a day. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. But it's it's really a micro market. You're looking at a very focused, focused, focused. very focused area. Okay. Interesting. So, all right, that, that leads me to another question that I had personally, because I bought one of those alligator rental properties yeah. and all right. then all of a sudden the sewer line breaks. Um, <laughs> so how, how do you estimate that kind of stuff, right? So, you know, kind of, kind of black swan, big, big, uh, you know, the sewer line breaks cost me, I don't know, six, six grand. Yeah, how do you so look at upkeep and, and maintenance and, right? There's, really, you- two, there's really two answers. First and foremost, uh, in my calculation, something I call make ready, right? Most of the time I bought junk. So I include the make ready cost in my cash on cash return okay? because I have to do that before a tenant moves in. So I'm upgrading the house to a pretty good standard where if something breaks, it's either a black swan or it's a tenant problem. That's where I'm trying to get it to. Okay. And if it's a tenant problem, like they broke a window, I bill them, right? Let's just be clear. But if it is the sewer line or you know the, the, the mechanicals break, that's why you have an emergency fund, right? So in the beginning, I would have 5,000 set aside per house. Eventually got to a point where I had 50 grand put away for any investments and that's been more than enough. Uh, but yeah, you have to have an emergency fund. I can't tell you how many sewer lines broke in between 2012 and 14 because houses were vacant for months and trees and bushes have yeah. this interesting thing of seeking water and sewer lines are a great source of water when worse comes to worse. And then you turn the water on and pop breaks terrible yeah been, been there <laughs> mm-hmm. all right well, what yeah so this is really interesting i think the um uh talking about your 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 bubble discussion going back to that i mean do you foresee i mean do you look out five years and, and try to forecast that or you just kind of let the market play out and kind of look at the metrics every day uh, i look at the metrics every day i i generally feel good about calling a year out That's what I've been generally pretty good at. Five years out, you have a new administration, you have tax changes, you have, you you could have 3D homes being, I mean, there's so many things. The the, the crystal ball gets very, very fuzzy at that point. But yeah, I feel generally good about a year. What's what, and what's your holding timeframe? How long do you hold it? Oh, when I buy something, I hold it forever. That's my intention. 
Okay. But again, clearly I sell, right? I sold a bunch in 06 and I sold a bunch in uh, 19. So what was your trigger but, then for selling? Just, just overheated willing, market, they, selling to strength? People were willing to overpay. People were willing to overpay. They, they bought a house for 275 or 267, sorry. That Here's the deal, right? I bought that house for 107. It ran for 1100. Cash flow. Yeah, cash flow is insane. Right? Yeah. The person who bought it for 267, it's still rented for 1100. No cash flow, but you know, if you want to, if you want to do that, I'll sell. And then in 2019, all these syndicators were coming out with multifamily offerings, and they were willing to buy apartments that needed two hundred thousand dollars in immediate repairs. <laughs> and you want to pay me retail and assume two hundred grand that I don't want to spend? Awesome, I'll sell. There must be a discounted cash flow thing that you could do to say, okay, now it's worth it. So like once the price reaches a level where um, like you say, it, it, it was, it was an 8% house is now a 0% house. Yeah. Right. I mean, and yeah. so um, the, the, right. The, right. Now the cash flow that somebody would get from buying that is going to be nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of discount what you're going to receive over time and say, okay, I could cash out now and receive 10 years worth of mm -hmm. my forward looking profits, because this is what the market tells me right now. And then there's a, probably a threshold line where you could say, okay, the, the return from a sale today is going to buy me 10 years worth of cash flows. Mm. Now it's worthwhile. I'm going to right. shift some of in these markets that are hot. I'm going to shift yeah. out a little bit. Yeah. That, I mean, I'm, yeah, you could, you could get very sophisticated with this. I'm a much simpler guy. Uh, with single family homes, it doesn't play with multifamily, but in single family homes, major metros have what's called the affordability index. And the right, affordability right. index in California, mm -hmm. and again, it's in my book, basically tells you when a market's unaffordable. So it, 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 in California, every market's different, but in California, it goes from one to a hundred. And what I would challenge you to do if you're in California is go to car.org, California Association Realtors.org. I think it's .org. Yeah, I think it's .org. And um, Look up the affordability for your market, but go back and look at it over time because it tells you when it gets unaffordable. So Fresno, California is the market I'm in. It's currently as of 2021, about a 47. In 2006 and seven, when I sold houses, it got under 20. It just screams unaffordable because it's only one in five people where today one in two could buy the average home. So for me, it's that affordability index, especially with residential. It doesn't play in multifamily. You could do your cap rates and all of that stuff for, for multi or apartments. But uh, for single family, I've found the affordability index to be a remarkable indicator of when things are overpriced or overheated. And is it, that's, that's brilliant. Is that again, market specific? So California yeah, might hit MSA. 20. MSA okay. down to the MSA level. So California has got, I don't know, 21 different MSAs or 12 or whatever it is. Very localized. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then, and then the localization is relative, right? So it wouldn't yeah. tell you anything about, you know, Nevada might hit uh, 40 and that might be overpriced for Nevada. Yeah. It might be. Yeah. Again, go look at history. The beauty of this stat is you can go back, you can take current knowledge and play it backwards. It's like stock trading in reverse. Mm -hmm. Do you know when Vegas declined? Yeah. Great. Go back and look at what the affordability index was that year. Go back and look further. And you, I mean, California has been doing it since the eighties. So you've got 40 years of history. You can go back and play with these charts. It's, it's kind of amazing. And, and in most markets, it's 20, but in San Francisco, it's 13. Just for example, right? Being all localized, right? San Francisco's got much higher income, lower numbers. But yeah, you know, 13, San Francisco's wow. 13. It's just nuts. And that's just screams unaffordable. <laughs> and, and 20 or 30 might be a great deal. In, in, San, in San Francisco, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Man, this is really, really helpful. Um, and we're kind of coming up on our roughly half hour point here. Um, anything else, guys? What, uh, Gene, I mean, I'm sure. I think, I, I think yeah. it might be interesting to hear what your advice would be. Like I said, I think there's going to be as many or more first-time home buyers sure. uh, in the community as there would be people looking to yeah, you know, that's build a, a little oh, okay, rental okay. empire. Um, let, let's take me, for example. Okay, okay. Um, um, I work know. a full-time job, steady income, um, above average in my country. I have yet to buy a home, and there are no statistics in my country to speak of. <laughs> 
No, I'm okay. just kidding. So let's just uh, assume I'm looking out for a home and mm -hmm. uh, what should I do? Well, I don't know your, your, I don't even, you haven't even told me what country you're in, so I have no color yeah, of what, I, what's going I, on. I'm in Lebanon, but let's just assume okay. I'm in the US, for example, or right, anywhere so that just, you're familiar with. All yeah. right, so assume you're in the United States, because again, what you'll have to know about yeah. other countries that I don't have color on is what's the lending standard, title standards. I don't, I, mm -hmm. I don't know Lebanon at all. But yeah, if you're in some state in Cal or the United States, one of the 50 states in the U.S. where you can get 30-year money and you know things that I'm familiar with, uh, the tell what I would tell you today in today's market because it's tight, it's hard today to be a first-time buyer. It's ridiculously hard. What I would tell you to do today is how long are you going to stay? Right. So for example, my wife and I bought a place in '99 when it was it was tough, but we were going to be there for 20 years because our daughter was going to start school there and finish high school there. We were to, we were not going to move. So if, if, if it's going to be your home for the next 10 or 20 years, it really doesn't matter. It's your forever home. It's generally speaking, better to own than rent if that's the case. But if you are one of these digital nomads and your intention is to move every two or three years, real estate has pretty hefty transaction costs yeah. to get in and get out. Um, so yeah. if that's you, probably not a great time to do it when the market's hot because you're probably going to get eaten alive at a minimum with transaction costs. So the big thing for owner occupant. First off, you don't follow my yield calculation or any of that stuff because it doesn't matter. Um, I'm only an investor. And you know, when we found the place we lived, it, numbers didn't matter. What was the school system? We wanted a newer versus older home. So we were kind of stuck. We got to pay what the market could bear. Um, so I don't take any of that yield calculation into consideration with your first time home. The only thing I would say is how long are you going to be there? And don't forget about transaction costs if you're going to be you know, a digital nomad and, and hit five states in 10 years. Yes, transaction costs, okay. realtor fees alone are four to 6%. Yep. You know? Yeah. Besides title and escrow and. Yeah. And then, right. <laughs> right. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. County, county tax, uh, you know, whatever. So mm -hmm. interesting. Um, well, listen, I, th listen, Michael, this has been fantastic. I, I do think we're going to get a lot of folks saying, can we bring him back for a, a deeper dive into X, Y, and Z? You know, I'm not, not sure what that would be. Sure. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, for sure. Always good to hear from somebody that, that uh, you know, did it on your own. So. 100% yeah. on our own. No, no, it's, it's just us. One, one rental at a time. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Uh, and I will provide a link to your book. Uh, the audio book version is really good. I, I personally prefer audio versions. Um, sure. Well, don't forget the five-star review. Yeah, it's got a really high review on Amazon. I forget what it is, but it's... Yeah, it's 531, great. I think. Five-star review. Yeah, it's pretty good for a self-published guy. Yeah, heck yeah, for sure. We'll try to get your name out there. More people need Thanks, to hear buddy. this. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Take care. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.